Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Miles and welcome back to my channel. Today's episode is going to be a, another case for my Curious Case series. Be sure to sign up to our newsletter and texting list so you can get notified as soon as a new video goes live. You can find a link in the description or in the pinned comment down below. But before we delve into this video, I'd just like to give a massive thank you to Netflix for sponsoring this episode. If you've seen my videos a few weeks back, you'll know that Netflix have recently released a brand new mystery series for you to binge watch called Young Wallander. I teased episode one in that last video, so let's talk about episode two. The episode starts out with Wallander waking up in hospital after being stabbed by the same man in black that was there at the start of episode one. Was it really the same man in black or was there a group working together? The junior detective finds himself promoted to detective to work on the case, and he soon finds himself chasing leads full of twists and turns. I've already binge watched the show twice just so I haven't missed out any details, and I was on the edge of my seat both both times I watched it. What happens in the nightclub in episode two really put me on edge. Who is responsible? Can you figure it out? Try and figure out who done it before Detective Wallander. Put your investigative skills to the test. The show is a six-part series based on the best-selling novels by Henning Mankell, and it is one of those Netflix shows, like I've said, that you just have to binge watch from start to finish. You can't just watch episode one or episode two and then just take a break from it. It's one of those ones where you're just hooked from the beginning to the end. Just when you think you know who's done it, you'll be thrown right back to square one. So once again, thank you so much to Netflix for sponsoring today's episode and helping keep this channel afloat. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel and you've hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time I post a brand new Curious Case episode. And with all that being said, let's delve right into this case. <laughs> Recently, um, what has come to light, there was this death in Belgium from this young man named uh, Sanda Dia, who was a student uh, of African descent who pledged for this white wealthy fraternity and basically they hazed him to death. The hazing was extreme. Uh, it was him and two others, but they treated him harsher than the other two people. Um, call him a nigger the whole time and you know I don't know Dutch people like to censor but I, I want to be clear about that because I need you to understand they saw him as a nigger they treated him as a nigger and because of that he died and I've heard people's you know I read a little bit I try not to read people's comments too much because it's upsetting and oh you know he was just hazed like everybody else no he was not you know, and, and the details of it, you know, are horrific. You know, this kind of hazing, the stuff that he had to drink, peeing on him, you name it. It was it was horrific. And yes, they did it to everybody else. But the level of salt in his body because of what they made him ingest was a lot higher than the others to the point that his organs failed. Um, and the fact that you call somebody a nigger the whole time. Um, yeah. Wednesday the 5th of December 2018, in the city of Lover, Belgium, was a tragic day which would end with mass anger and outrage at the rich students of KU Lover. In a case that would take two years to see the courtrooms, a case riddled with powerful people, racial discrimination and the brutal ending of an extremely intelligent and promising young mind, Let's explore the case of Sander Dia. So who was Sander Dia? What was he like? What were his aspirations and dreams? Sander Dia was born on Thursday the 9th of April 1998 
in the Belgian municipality of Adachem in the province of Antwerp. He was the son of a Belgian mother and a Senegalese father, and he had met his best friend, who he would later go on to university with, when he was in kindergarten. Sander's friends described him as someone who could make friends with anyone. He was the kind of person that you could go to with your issues and problems and without any form of judgement he would inspire you with his advice. Sander wasn't the kind of person to make any enemies, he always seemed to find something he shared in common with everybody that he met. He was ambitious, funny and very very intelligent. Sander was known by his childhood friends as being the Michael Jackson of Adachem on account of his dance moves and his love for having a good time resonated so closely with his friends. He loved music through and through, especially the scores from movies such as Inception and The Lion King. Sander's father had never had the opportunity to study at university, which is why Sander was so beyond proud of himself for graduating from his school with top grades and going on to study at a highly prestigious program at one of the top universities in the country, the Catholic University of Lover, otherwise known as KU Lover. Alongside his best friend, Sander applied to study civil engineering at KU Lover and was accepted onto the program. And so, after graduating from OLVE Comprehensive School in 2016, Sander made the 45 km move to the city of Lover to begin his civil engineering studies with his best friend by his side. Sander's first two years of study on the program went really, really well for him. He consistently achieved high grades, which eventually saw him in 2018 in his third year of study, just a stone's throw away from graduation. Now, the real reasoning as to why Sander decided in his third year to join the fraternity Rujahom is largely up in the air. Sander's friends believe he had decided to join the fraternity to establish connections for post-graduation. After all, many of Rujahom's members were children of, or related to, people in high and powerful positions, such as highly respected lawyers, barons, and judges. And the vast majority of Rujahom members had substantial financial funds behind them to ensure they would go far. It is believed that Sander joins the fraternity due to this so that he could open up more doors further down the road. But the fraternity was not without negative press. Rujahom was founded on the 21st of February 1946 under a different name. In 1956, the fraternity's name was changed to what it is now, Rujahom, which is, according to the official Wikipedia page, a reference to local folklore. Rujahom quickly became one of the leading and most sought-after fraternities at KU Lova and was soon considered to be very elitist. One of the methods in which the fraternity protects its elite and exclusive reputation is through a long-standing tradition of extreme hazing. Now I've actually covered a hazing case previously on this channel and with every case I stumble upon where hazing is involved, I become more and more confused as to why extreme hazing as a practice is still permissible. In 2013, the fraternity came under fire due to a complaint lodged against them by an animal rights group. A video was leaked to social media which depicted initiates abusing and killing a piglet as part of the hazing ceremony. Now no formal charges were ever brought against any members of the fraternity following the complaints, but the KU Lova University did draw up a document called a hazing charter. This hazing charter was created to make hazing practices safer, and it required those who signed it to report the date and time of any hazing ceremony to the city, and to abstain from the use of violence, racism, extortion, bullying, sexual assault, discrimination, and the use of vertebrates in the ritual. Rituals. The KU Lova 2013 hazing charter was categorically refused by the fraternities and sororities at the university, meaning that not one society actually signed the charter. It's interesting that no formal disciplinary actions were brought against the societies for not signing this charter, and the charter was soon laid to rest. 
That was until 2018 when Rujaham began their fresh intake of initiates to join. Now, there does exist officially used terminology for initiates and those who decide on what the initiates have to do during the hazing ceremonies, but to avoid confusion, I shall simply be referring to the initiates as initiates and those who are controlling the hazing as senior members of the group. The senior members were responsible for quote unquote helping the initiates become official members of the fraternity. Sander joins the fraternity with nine other students near the start of his third year. Now, up until 2015, Rujaham had been exclusively white. The first black member or person of colour to join the fraternity occurred in 2015, and up until Sander decided to join, the fraternity had only ever had that one non-white member. Sander was the second person of colour to apply to join the fraternity, and unfortunately, he faced heavy racism from some of the members. Out of the nine other people that applied to join the fraternity alongside Sander, only two other people made it through the initial stages. This meant that there were three initiates, including Sander. And according to Sander's best friend, Sander was rarely all too excited to go to the weekly fraternity club nights as part of the initial stages. Allegedly, Sander was made to drink a substantial amount of alcohol and to drink the urine of official members of the fraternity. The most notable event during these initial stages of joining the fraternity that occurred to Sander took place in October of 2018, two months before the hazing ceremonies. The fraternity had hosted a cantus, which is a traditional activity including the vast consumption of alcohol and singing traditional songs, and at the end of the evening, the event space where the cantus had taken place needed to be cleaned and cleared away. Senior members of the fraternity decided that Sander should be the one to undertake the clearing of the tables, and so the senior members called out to Sander using racial slurs, predominantly with the use of the N-word, and told Sander that, quote, black people should work for the whites. The hall manager at the event space overheard this disgusting and horrific use of racist and discriminatory language and confronted the senior members defending Sander, though the hall manager was told to, quote, mind his own business. Despite this extremely racist event, Sander continued to attend club nights with the fraternity. It is believed that he values the connections he can make to further his career more than the racial abuse that he had endured. The hazing ceremonies officially began for the three initiates on the 4th of December 2018, and as with tradition, the hazing would be a two-day event, overseen by senior members of the fraternity. The first task to commence the hazing began at just after 4pm in the city of Lova. The initiates had to sell roses in the city streets of Lova. The task was to sell as many roses as possible, and if you didn't sell as many roses as the other initiates, then you would endure punishments. Those punishments included drinking spoiled milk to eating a fat ball, which is intended for birds, and downing copious amounts of alcohol. Sander ended up selling 30 less roses than the other two initiates, which meant that he faced the most severe punishments. Sander was made to drink a lot of alcohol for selling the least, and he subsequently became very drunk very quickly. According to one of the people that were present at the hazing, quote, he was already so drunk that he couldn't speak anymore. By 7pm that evening on the 4th of December 2018, Sander was extremely intoxicated, though the hazing continued. The second task in the ceremony began, which saw the initiates kneeling on their knees while being asked questions by the senior members. If they got an answer wrong, they had to drink. Unfortunately for Sander, by the end of the second task in the hazing, he had already drunk one and a half bottles of straight gin. Sander was described as being unable to walk by himself, and he appeared very pale. At about 10 minutes past 9 that night, the fraternity hosted a cantus for all the members and initiates. The fraternity by this point had 18 official members. At the cantus, the three initiates were made to drink even more alcohol, beer, gin, and vodka. 
The initiate's final task of the evening was to guess how many beers they could still chug without passing out. Now I'm unsure how many beers Sander said he could still chug, but what we do know is that he drank six or seven more beers during that task. At beer five, he actually threw up before continuing. After the sixth or seventh beer, Sander passed out. Now, one of the traditions that the fraternity enforced during their hazing ceremonies was that if an initiate passed out, official members of the fraternity would urinate on them. As it turns out, all three initiates actually ended up passing out and were subsequently urinated on. The senior members did put the three initiates in the recovery position so they would avoid choking on their vomit if they were to throw up again. At the end of the Cantus, at about midnight, the senior members took the three initiates back to their student living accommodations, where they taped and shut off the water supply to the taps so that the initiates couldn't drink any water to sober up. The senior members further cut chunks of hair off the head of the passed out initiates and spread Nutella and tomato ketchup all over the initiates and their bedroom. Sander had to be carried to his bed during this process and was more or less completely unresponsive. The following day, on the 5th of December 2018, at about half past 10 in the morning, senior members of the fraternity woke up the hungover initiates to begin the final day of hazing. According to a witness, Sander seemed to be very disconnected and wasn't responding like the other two initiates. The fraternity members then began the journey to a cabin near Turnhout, which is owned by one of the senior members' family. On the way to the cabin, the group made several stops. They were actually stopped by a woman who worked at KU Lover, who asked whether Sander was okay, but the senior members dismissed her and continued on their journey. The group then splits up, with the initiates being taken straight to the cabin, while senior members went to a local pet store to buy some fish, some eels, fat balls used for feeding birds, and live mice. The senior members then went to a store called Exotic World to purchase litres of fish oil. Some sources report that Sander actually stayed with the senior members, while other sources said he was taken straight to the cabin. But what we do know for sure was that Sander could barely walk and had to be supported by other members of the group. The fraternity members arrived at the cabin at around 10 minutes past midday and immediately upon arrival, the initiates were made to dig three wells, three pits. These pits or wells would be where the initiates would spend the rest of the day and evening for the final parts of the hazing. After the wells had been dug, senior members ordered the initiates into their own well and were made to take their top off so they would be half naked. The senior members then filled these wells with water, which, bear in mind it was December, was absolutely freezing. One source reports that the outside temperature was about 8 degrees centigrade at the time, after which the next task in the hazing began. This task was another question and answer style task, and if you got the answer right, then you would be rewarded with a sip of water or a sip of a sports drink. If you got an answer wrong, then you'd have to eat or drink something gross. Bear in mind that Sander was seemingly still very out of it when this task began. It's not exactly clear what Sander consumed during this task, but it would have included the consumption of fish oil and urine. After that task had been completed, they moved on to the next. This task involved a live eel which was placed in the well where the initiates were standing, and Sander had to catch the eel and bite its head off, which he did. By the time 7pm came around, the initiates had been in the wells for around 7 hours, standing in the freezing cold water. The 7pm task entailed the initiates swallowing a live goldfish and then drinking fish oil to make them throw back up the goldfish. You see, fish oil is very repulsive to consume and it makes you gag. The other two initiates were able to successfully regurgitate the goldfish, but Sander couldn't. So the senior members instructed Sander to continue drinking fish oil and every time he would throw up only the fish oil and the goldfish wouldn't come up. So they kept making him drink more and more fish oil. All throughout this, other official members of the fraternity were lightly kicking the initiates in the back as they were actually kneeling in the freezing cold wells. 
According to witnesses, the initiates were completely mentally broken by the hazing. The official members of the fraternity also urinated on them whenever they needed the toilet. Apparently, this was actually done to, quote, keep them warm. Some of the fraternity members noticed that Sander seemed to be extremely cold and despondent, so they pulled him out of the well to try to warm him up. Though, just a few minutes later, they put him back in the freezing cold well and poured more water over him and the other initiates. It's important to note that traditionally in this fraternity's hazing ceremony, there is a bell near the wells where the initiates are, which they can ring if they give up to signal that they've had enough and they just need time out, they need to dip out of it. But during this ceremony, one of the senior members had actually left this bell at home and had forgotten it, which meant there was no way to clearly signal that the initiates were finished and that they wanted out. A deleted video recovered later in the investigation revealed that one of the official members took a dump, for lack of a better phrase, on one of the initiates, but it's unclear which initiate this happened to. A deleted photo also depicted Sander passed out on the grass. At 7.30pm, the senior members decided that it was dinner time for the initiates. The senior members served the initiates a sausage, each with toothpaste all over it. After they'd eaten that, they then poured 10 more buckets of ice-cold water on the initiates before throwing a firework into each well. By this point, Sander was completely disconnected and wasn't responding. At around 20 past 8 that evening, the other two initiates pulled Sander out of the well he was in and laid him down by a nearby campfire. They changed him out of the wet clothes and into some dry clothes to warm him up. None of the other official members or senior members helped these two initiates to do this. Around this same time, um, another deleted photo was taken of Sander as he was unconscious. Following this, the senior members decided to place one of the live mice in a blender as the next task was for the initiates to consume a mixed up blend of mice and other items. The initiates also had to bite the head off a live mice. But, that, but before that could happen, the official members of the fraternity began to finally grow concerned for Sander's well-being. They placed him on a trash bag in front of the fire for a short while before moving him into a car. They only kept the heating on in the car for about five minutes before they decided to take him back out again and put him by the campfire. Sander was unresponsive. One of the other initiates tried to give Sander a Fanta so that Sander could get some sugar, but a senior member didn't allow them to. It wasn't long before Sander was in the fetal position and making some very strange noises. It was only as Sander's condition began to worsen by the second that the senior members realised something was seriously wrong. At 8.57pm, a phone call was placed to the emergency services. They decided the best thing to do was to take Sander straight to the hospital. The senior members told the emergency services that Sander was very cold and exhausted, but they failed to mention the vast amounts of fish oil that he had consumed and all the other irregular things that they had made him consume. Fish oil in the amount Sander had consumed posed a massive threat to him due to the high doses of salts that had entered his bloodstream. When the senior members moved Sander into the car to go to the hospital, they didn't put him on the back seat where he could benefit from the car's heating, but instead they placed him in the trunk, or the boots for my fellow Brits. The trunk would have had little to no insulation from the freezing December temperatures, which meant that Sander had to complete this entire journey without any heating and still freezing cold. It also meant that it was next to impossible to monitor Sander over the journey. The final stage of the hazing would have been to lie naked in the forest for two hours alone, but the senior members decided to postpone this until Sander could get the all clear. Little did anybody realise at the time, Sander would never be discharged from the hospital. At 9.15pm, the group with Sander arrived at Hospital Marla. He was immediately admitted and hospitalised with severe hypothermia. Sander had a body temperature of just 27 degrees Celsius, or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. He was in a life-threatening condition, but the doctors hadn't yet realised that the high levels of salts in his blood, along with the severe dehydration, was actually causing his body to start acidification. 
Acidification can cause the kidneys to fail, which in turn can lead to multiple organ failure. The other two initiates were also admitted to hospital, but were discharged fairly quickly. About 45 minutes after being admitted to Hospital Marla, Sander was transferred to the University Hospital of Antwerp, which is where they discovered the extremely high salt content in his blood. While Sander's parents rushed to the hospital to be by his side, the senior members of the fraternity ordered the other members to clean up everything to do with the hazing. This included the Nutella and tomato ketchup mess that had been made in Sander's bedroom and turning back on the water supply to his accommodation. They cleared up the campsite next to the cabin and filled the wells in. This was so when the police inevitably came to the campsite to look for evidence, they would find nothing. Back at the university hospital, doctors had determined that Sander was going into MOF, otherwise known as multiple organ failure. His organs were shutting down one by one. Twenty-year-old Sander, a civil engineering student at one of the most prestigious universities in the country, was dying. Sadly, Sander Dia passed away a few hours after being admitted on the 5th of December 2018 with his parents by his side. It's important to note that some sources list Sander's death to have occurred two days later on the 7th of December, but most sources list the 5th. The following day, a message was sent to the now deleted WhatsApp fraternity group chats that read, quote, Actually, we are a bunch of monkeys with that hazing ceremony. It is inhumane what happens there. Detectives were quick to investigate what had happened. Shortly after Sander's death on the 5th of December 2018, investigators went to the campsite where the hazing had taken place. They arrived at around 3.50am to find the site completely clean, with not a piece of litter in sight. The wells that the initiates had been made to stand in were gone. It was as if nothing had happened. Senior members of the fraternity had ordered the 18 official members to delete their text messages, pictures and videos from their phones. Those messages, images and videos have since been recovered by investigators. A few days after Sander's passing, the 18 members of the fraternity began to plan to write a joint letter of apology to Sander's family, but their attorneys talked them out of doing so. The fraternity disbanded shortly thereafter, and the 18 members went into complete silence. No public apologies have been made by any of the members. The KU Lova, the university the members go to, held a disciplinary hearing following Sander's death. As a result of this hearing, all 18 members were allowed to continue their studies at the university on the basis that they complete 30 hours of community service and write a paper. That was their punishment for the death of Sander Dia. This was obviously extremely controversial. Many people believe that the punishment from the university was so light due to the fact that the 18 members came from very wealthy and influential families. The case took two years to go to the courts due to one of the 18 members accused being the son of an Antwerp judge. Other members had other links to legal professionals which would have caused a conflict of interest, meaning a mistrial. The case was finally moved after a long period of time from the Antwerp province to Limburg. On the 31st of July 2020, Limburg's public prosecutor confirmed that criminal proceedings against the 18 fraternity members had been referred to a local court of the first instance. The charges brought against the 18 members included charges of degrading treatments, administration of harmful substances and manslaughter. These charges carry a prison sentence of 2-10 to 10 years. On the 4th of September 2020, all 18 of the accused members were due to appear in court to begin the trial, but at the last minute, two defence lawyers filed a request for additional investigation. This delays the case by at least a month, if not longer. It's interesting to note that no additional investigations had been requested in 20 months prior to this, so it was likely a delay tactic by the defence teams. It's my personal hope that the investigating judge grants this additional investigation request, as if it's declined, the defence lawyers can then appeal, which will continue to draw out the trial. It could result in years of waiting for justice to be served. 
It's important to note that some sources allege that racist and discriminatory language was used against Sander during the hazing that led to his death. I don't typically cover cases that are ongoing on this channel, but after so many of you reached out and requested this case, I had to take a look. I've been blessed with this amazing platform, which I can use to signal boost certain topics that desperately need it. And so I wish to ask you all to take a minute out of your day to go to the petition that I've linked in the description and in the pinned comment and to sign it. The 18 members of the fraternity walk free and are still able to attend their university courses, albeit remotely. The petition is for the police department to arrest all 18 members to await the trial as to avoid any further delay tactics. Earlier this month, at the beginning of September 2020, the KU LOVA opened a new investigation into the death of Sander Dia, which will hopefully see those involved severely reprimanded or even expelled. My heart is shattered and aching for the family and friends of Sander Dia. I'd like to end my coverage of this case with some final words from Aminita, who you saw at the start of the video. Make sure you go over to her channel and subscribe to her as her input has been really helpful in this case. So race was involved. Class was also involved. He was the only one, you know, all these, these boys, it was 18 of them. All of them are the sons of doctors, lawyers politicians and he was not his father works at a factory but saw membership as a way for him to have a network after he graduated so that's you know it's, it's horrific and i'm thinking about the parents who sent their child in all good faith to get an education to better his life and you know you don't send your child out there to get killed obviously as a mother myself uh, that's horrible um, and, and there's two things that struck me about this. Uh, one thing that was very encouraging is the fact that, you know, so this happened two years ago and finally now it's going to court and the details are being brought out. That's why we're talking about it now. And now listen to this. The reason it took so long, according to the news reports, and again, you know, this is just based on the news. It took so long also to go to court because they could not find a judge that was not a father of one of those boys. Now think about that. You know, when we're talking about class and we're talking about power, all those boys, <laughs> you know, very well connected. And so they could not find a judge that was not related to these boys. That's why it took so long. So just think about that. And, and another thing that really struck me about this, um, is the fact what really struck me you know about this you know they they took you know they they tortured these boys and he was obviously ill and they left him laying there for at least an hour until finally they're like okay we got to do something then they took him to the hospital left him there and then when he died the first thing they did is they cleaned up everything right they cleaned up erased all the, the, the trails of what they've done. They, they disbanded, removed themselves from social media. You know, they went silent to protect themselves, obviously. They had good, fancy lawyers. Now I'm assuming, and I could be wrong, I'm assuming their parents paid for these lawyers. And this is what, what it said in the newspaper. They were going to write a letter of apology to the parents and the lawyers told them not to. That right there, boy. Wow, man. That right there, you know, um, you know, and of course it's coming through, you know, they were having fun, you know, call them all kinds of names, the torture they had already announced is going to be harsher than ever. So they had fun. They had fun, you know, uh, and of course they didn't mean for him to die, but they didn't really care a whole lot about his life. And there were reports of other racial incidents even before this hazing incident with him. So, you know, they didn't really care a whole lot. They want to protect themselves. Logical, not nice, but logical. But that a letter of apology was going to be written and the parents through the lawyers said, do not apologize. What does this say about parenting? What does this say about us as a community? Um, these boys are the next politicians. These boys are the next lawyers. These boys are the next judges. And they have learned when you make a mistake, when you make a mistake as so grievous as to take somebody's life, you don't have to apologize. These are our future leaders. 
and this is what their parents want from them. That's a scary thought. You know, I, I, I read this, this study once, uh, this journal article about uh, Sierra Leone, and they had one of those reconciliation courts, and what had happened during the war, these, these men had done these atrocious things, you know, killed people, and they had to apologize. You know, truth, they had to tell the truth. And as they were sitting there, they were not contrite. You know, they, you know, you know, they, you know, how our men can do this. Yeah, yeah, I did it. So what? I mean, they didn't say that, but that was their attitude. But then when they had to get up, get in front of these people and go on their knees and beg for forgiveness, they shifted. Everything shifted and they booed and cried and, ah, you know, and so with these young men, I have no doubt that when they were going through that, they didn't give a damn about this boy. They didn't give a damn about him. I don't care that they say now they feel guilty and they're upset. Yeah, of course, they, I, don't, I don't care. But still making that apology would have shifted something, would have given me some hope, you know, that some seed is planned, that some message would be given to them on a different visceral level that could help them. You know, now, you know, they've done this act uh, they thought they could get away with it. They were the sanction they got from the schools that they had to write a paper. You know, so initially I was like, oh, apparently at this school you have students and you have niggers, right? Because students you protect and students you help raise. But when it's about, you know, when you look at your people as niggers, they can just die and whatever. So, so initially I was ready to rake this university over the coals, but I know some faculty there who are wonderful and brilliant and I know I've met students from there who are wonderful and brilliant so I was like ah, okay breathe don't go off and so the the beautiful thing that has come out of this and again and I keep saying this it is the young people it's the young people who have come forward and it's like that was our friend and you are going to treat him fairly. They had a sit-in, 300 students came. Another day was another sitting. I think 400 students came. They're like, we will not let this slide. We are waiting, we are patient, but you will do right by our friend. And so, you know, and because of these students, the university is now saying, okay, we, we're going to look into this again, because yeah, maybe just writing a paper is not enough of a punishment for murdering somebody. Um, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm grateful for these young people. Like it's, it's the young people that are holding us to the fire. It's the young people who are expecting us to step up. And so I, I felt better knowing that it's young people who are making sure we want a fair trial. Um, you know, and the other lesson of this is that we have to learn collectively about these mechanisms and how they work. You know, these, these boys, they were well connected. Like I said, their fathers are judges, lawyers, politicians, according to the paper. And look what happens. You can screw up. We all screw up. I mean, this is a major screw up. You can screw up. But the fact that the mechanism went into place to protect them, because we want to ensure that they have a good future. We don't want them to be bothered. And they don't have to apologize. They have parents. And this is how they raise their children. And these are our future leaders. So be aware, you know, learn, learn, you know, how are we as a community going to hold each other accountable? I'm not even worried about these boys. I would like to sit down with these parents. Those are the ones I would like to talk to, you know, because this is not okay. If your child acts out, you know, you pull them back in line. I know that's what I do with my sons. I know that's what my parents did for me. You scratch somebody's car. I know my mama would send you right back out there. So... So think about, you know, collectively, our goal is to change these mechanisms, these mechanisms that maintain this idea that it's okay that some stories value less than others. This boy's matter, life mattered less than others. Anybody who has a doubt that black lives matter, phew, I don't know what you rock, you know, you've been laying under. But anyway, don't let, don't let me go off because this is about encouragement. And so number one, our students, our young people, I salute you in, in Leuven and Belgium. Thank you. Keep up the good work. And number two, you know, be aware of these systems and mechanisms. Hold people accountable. Address them. We have to decide about what is acceptable and what is unacceptable for us as a community. 
Um, and as parents, we got to do better. Yeah, our children mess up. Even our rich children do. Uh, and lovingly, we still, you know, we still have to keep them straight if we want to, you know, anyway, I've said enough. I hope you have a good day. I hope the weather where you are is better than it is here. Cold and rainy, typical Dutch weather. Um, and be encouraged. There's good stuff out there. You know, there's hard, painful stuff, but there's good stuff out there too. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel and you've hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time I post a brand new Curious Case episode just like this one. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case.